Good morning. We lost my mom on April 21st, and we laid her to rest on the day between her granddaughter's birthday and my birthday. And I had the honor of giving a eulogy to my mom. And a friend of mine whose mother-in-law just passed in Florida said, I don't know quite what to do. And I said, write a eulogy. And, and uh, even if you don't give it, think about those things that you would honor your mother with. And if she's still with you, write that eulogy now and talk about those things. My mom and I had a chance to tell all these stories before she passed. So here's what I shared. People knew Glenda, Mom, Mrs. Hammock, Grandma, in different ways. They all had words to describe her and the context in which they knew her. To me, she was caring, a servant to others, and a quiet leader. She was accomplished, nurturing, feisty, feisty and fiercely devoted to her family. I walked through the grounds of the Indianapolis Museum of Art to write this because within those grounds are many things that remind me of mom. She was an artist. She studied at Heron School way back in the day. She drew well, she wrote with a beautiful hand, she decorated the best birthday cakes in the world. And she helped her kids and grandkids color and paint and sculpt and put together some things best described as mixed media. And the ones that we didn't keep, she, keep, she put in her special places, folders and binders, frames and on tables, and always kept safe in her heart. Mom was a gardener. The IMA brags now about having 250,000 things in bloom. Pish posh, my mom planted more than that every year. She and dad maintained about a half an acre table garden that we used for food when I was a kid on the farm. We would listen to the Indy 500, drag every garden hose we had to bring water from the barn, and we would plant and plant and plant. My dad ran the tiller, and he would get wide swaths of unwanted vegetation out of the way. But my mom did the hard weeding in the rows, bent over all summer, and we would all help whether we liked it or not. More though, she planted seeds in us, seeds of inquiry, value, and determination. She showed us how we could be good and kind and smart and still fun. She nurtured all around her family, friends, and acquaintances. She had many involvements in groups and organizations, usually as a charter member, oftentimes as president, always as secretary, it seemed. She harvested bountiful crops, accomplishments by her family, stories of and postcards from adventures and travels she had encouraged, recitals, swim meets, horse shows, volleyball matches, 4-H meetings, graduations, grandparents' days, weddings, births, and passages. She reaped hours, serves, patients helped, and took great joy in the world. Rarely shared a bad thought or word about them. My sister and I filled in for her there. <laughs> Mom was a woman ahead of her time in quiet accomplishment. She was a career woman before the war. And she married outside her station. The city girl fell hard for her country man. This was quite unpopular with her family, but she knew her heart, took the difficult path, and with Gordon made a wonderful home as as a full partner and always as an advocate. Mom did the books for the farm. That one year accounting job at Lilly really paid off. And since dad worked second shift at Allison's, my mom was the day foreman, driving trucks and tractors, corralling run runaway hogs and cattle, bottle feeding the lambs and shoveling corn, snow, manure, and cold for the old stoker furnace. She had a wry sense of humor, which blossomed with the adulthood of her brood, oh my. But as she aged like a fine wine, her humor mellowed and became more nuanced. Uh, no, scratch that. Uh, she honed this rapier wit that always had good humor behind it, but it was sharp, and unless you knew what was going on, it might throw you. The new nurses at Homewood Healthcare had to be kind of warned about Mrs. Hammock, and then once they saw her smile, she became one of her favorite residents. She gave special blessings to those who cared for her in the last years of her life. Mom gave great hugs. You can ask grandkids, Katie, Emily, or Brett. She welcomed new comers to the family with those same open, open arms, and you can ask our loves, Chris, Matt, Josh, and Allie. She tolerated our imperfections and suffered with us our missteps and our miscues, asked my sister Jane and me, and she gave advice that when taken was generally spot on, and you could ask any of us. Mom canned green beans, tomatoes, and alum pickles, froze corn, berries, and peppers. She made the best macaroni and cheese in the world. Strawberry rhubarb pie, iced tea, and grilled cheese sandwich with or without crust, and the meatloaf, oh my, the meatloaf. I imagine St. Peter asked for a slice, probably with mashed potatoes, lima beans, and a piece of my mom's cherry pie. Mom would have asked in return for coconut shrimp, 
sweet potato casserole with dad, and maybe one of those little drinks with an umbrella in it. As I walked through the gardens and galleries at the art museum, I, these thoughts were all in my head and these memories, and I went looking for a quiet place to write them down, and I was kind of distracted, and I walked into the Asian art gallery and walked for a ways before I realized that the lights weren't on. You know, in these modern art installations, you don't know whether you've blown a circuit breaker or whether it's part of the experience. So I just walked in this great loop through the gallery in almost near darkness, and after a bit I started to recognize the details of the art as I passed through, all still there but obscured behind a mask of gray, harder to see but just as beautiful. And so it is with my mom, Glinda Mae Jones Hammock. She's still all around us, just a glance away, clear behind a veil of memory. You can't touch her, but you can still see the gleam in her eyes, hear her praise for a job well done, feel her guiding hand, and taste that meatloaf. So let's think about all the mothers today, and as for a special prayer, Katie's going to come up and tell stories about grandmothers. Thank you. This was my hallway last week, broken, sharp, treacherous. It was my son who did this. Sometimes, often really, things break irreparably. And it takes your breath away, straight away. It took my breath away when my son stormed into the bathroom, frustrated, angry, fed up, for his own very significant reasons. And when he chose to slam the bathroom door, causing the heavy mirror mounted to the front, to slip out of the hardware and to crash onto the floor, a million broken pieces were left, reflecting the afternoon light. I was quiet. I surveyed the damage, took a deep breath, put the dog outside so he wouldn't cut his feet, and put the cat in the basement so she wouldn't do the same. I walked into the backyard and I felt the hot tears streaming down my face. It's amazing how alone you can feel as a single parent in moments like these. I realized how scared and disappointed I felt. Did this really just happen? Yes, this is for real. And as I stood and considered whether or not this was an indication of his developing character, I heard his tears through the window above me, coming from inside the bathroom. His soul hurt. This was not what he expected either. Hello, anger. I don't remember inviting you into my house. Scary, terrified, ashamed, worried, scared. Deep breath. Hashtag mama warrior. Deep breath. That small, fragile soul needs you right now. He needs your very best, your biggest compassion, your most gentle and firm mama love and reassurance. More deep breaths. Go, mama. Go. Go now. Go open the front door. Tiptoe through the broken glass. Watch the bathroom door crack open and see the face that you love the most in the world, red with worry and wet with tears. His voice is suddenly so small. Mama, I'll never do it again, and I am so sorry. More tears, more weeping, such uncertainty on his sweet face. Go, Mama, get him. Go now, scoop him into your lap. Yep, you're crying too. Wow, this was big. Hold him tight and watch how he curls into a ball in your arms so quickly. See how eager he is to be loved by you, to be reassured by you. See how small he still is. See how fragile that spirit is. I love you. You are safe. I am right here. The worst part is over now. I've got you. I'm here. I love you. Go, Mama. Tell him about anger. Tell him now. Anger is a really powerful feeling. You have a right to your anger. 
anger burns hot. It can purify. It can also destroy. He nods. He feels it. He's met anger now. There's a better way to show your big feelings, and we'll work on it together. Tomorrow, I'm here to help you. You're safe. You are never alone in your anger. You are never alone in your fears. I'm here, and we're here together. And now, we will clean together. And we cleaned up the broken pieces, and we swept, and we vacuumed. It was quiet work. It was careful work. It was thoughtful work. Sometimes things break. Sometimes we break them. It's not the breaking that matters. The how or the why. What matters is how we choose to respond to the brokenness. Does it kill us? Does it throw us into a downward spiral of blame and punishment? Or does it help us remember how to love deepest? Does it push us towards compassion and over the hurdle of rightness and wrongness into loveness? Yes, loveness. So go, Mama. Go now. Get that baby of yours. Teach that. Show that. Live that. It's called loveness. Go now. I Love You Forever, a story by Robert Munch. A new mother holds her brand new baby, and she gently rocks him back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And as she does, she sings, I'll love you forever, I'll like you for always. As long as I'm living, my baby you'll be. Well, that new baby, he grows and he grows and he grows until he is two years old. And oh my goodness, he gets into everything. He pulls the books off the shelf. He pulls the food out of the refrigerator. He even flushes his mother's watch down the toilet. There are days his mother says, this kid is driving me crazy. But sometimes, on the darkest of nights, she goes to his room, opens the door, crawls across the floor, looks up over the side of the bed, and if that two-year-old is really asleep, she lifts him up into her arms and she gently rocks him back and forth and back and forth, and as she does, she sings. I'll love you forever, I'll like you for always. As long as I'm living, my baby will be. Well, that two-year-old, he grows and he grows until he is nine years old. And well, he never wants to come in for dinner. He never wants to take a bath. And when his grandmother visits, he says bad words. There are times that his mother says, I think I ought to sell you to the zoo. But sometimes, when that nine-year-old is asleep, dark at night, his mother goes to his room, opens the door, crawls across the floor, looks up over the side of the bed. And if that nine-year-old is really asleep, she lifts him up into her arms, and she gently rocks him back and forth and back and forth. And as she does, she sings. I'll love you forever, I'll like you for always. As long as I'm living, my baby will be. Well, that nine-year-old, he grows and he grows and he grows until he becomes a teenager. And well, he listens to strange music he tattoos odd things on his body, and he has very strange friends. There are times that his mother says, I think I'm living in a zoo. But sometimes, on the darkest of nights, his mother goes to his room, opens the door, crawls across the floor, looks up over the side of the bed, and if that teenager is really asleep, she lifts him up into her arms, and she gently rocks him back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And as she does, she sings, 
I'll love you forever, I'll like you for always. As long as I'm living, my baby you'll be. Well, that teenager, he grows and he grows and he grows until he becomes a man. And he moves out of his mother's house and he gets a house across town. But sometimes, on the darkest of nights, his mother gets in her car, drives across town, goes to his house, and if it's dark, she opens the window, crawls across the floor, looks up over the side of the bed, and if that grown man is really asleep, yes, she does. She picks him up into her arms, and she gently rocks him back and forth and back and forth. And as she does, she sings. I'll love you forever, I'll like you for always. As long as I'm living, my baby you'll be. Well, that mommy, she grows older and older and older. And one day she calls her son and she says, You need to come and see me because I am very sick and I am very old. So the boy goes to his mother's house, and when he arrives, she is so excited to see him that she begins to sing. Ow, ow, ow. But she can't remember the words to the song because she is too sick and she is too old. So do you know what that very grown boy does? He goes to his mother. And he lifts her up into his arms, and he gently rocks her back and forth and back and forth. And as he does, he sings, I'll love you forever, I'll like you for always. As long as I'm living, my mommy you'll be. That night, when the grown man arrived home, he stood at the top of the stairs for a very long time. And then he opened the door to his baby girl's bedroom. He lifted her up into his arms, and he gently rocked her back and forth and back and forth. And as he did, he sang, I'll love you forever, I'll like you for always. As long as I'm living, my baby you'll be. Will you pray with me? Holy God, we give you thanks and praise today for a mother's love, for nurturing love. We remember those who long to have children and are not able. We remember those on this day who have children they have lost or mothers they have lost. Remind all of us that you have put a special spirit of nurture and love in each and every one of us. We pray that indeed everyone knows the amazing mothering love that can come from you through us. Remind us, God, that you're going to love us forever and ever. Amen.